This show is brought to you by Club Force. Club Force is a sports participation system to help volunteers raise funds, manage data, and communicate with its members. Delighted to be joined by Neil Ewing, Joe Sheridan, and Paddy Kassan to look ahead at the National Football League semi finals and relegation uh, semi finals as well. Um, Coming to you first, Neil, I suppose, it's a bit of a weird one, I suppose, looking ahead to the games this weekend now, when in Division 2 and 4, uh, there's going to be no league finals, uh, and there can be a possibility of going well in Division 1 and 3 of league finals, but we could have no league finals to look forward to next weekend then. Yeah, definitely. It's a very strange one. Um, I think, you know, personally myself, I, I would have liked to see them uh, maybe even play the semi. I know we had a, a free weekend last again in the football, but maybe even play the semi finals uh, last again. I know it would have been a, a lot of games on the trot for, for teams and for squads, but um, at least it would have given us the opportunity to finish out the leagues this weekend and get, get league finals played across all four divisions. And you know, I think we would have been left with some, some great games, some really exciting games, especially. You know, you look at Division One. Uh, you know, whoever wins those two semi-finals, that, that was obviously going to be a Mount Water in semi-final. But yeah, right, right across across the divisions, you could have had some great finals. And yeah, the argument will be a lot of games on the trot for teams, but it definitely it would have given teams an opportunity to use their squads. And uh, you know, ultimately, you know, what what was the worst that could have happened? You know, it was uh, it was a, a playoff for uh, for promotion. It's it's maybe a little bit different in terms of the relegation games. You could have maybe give their teams in the relegation battle last weekend off and, and played the relegation games this weekend. Then so yeah, maybe just the pity that they didn't uh, they didn't love to get the leagues finished out. It's it's definitely disappointing for the players as well. That, you know, it's it's a chance to win a medal for for a lot of players. You know, really all you're left with is four provincial championships and in all Ireland. So you probably you're going you're going to only going to have four. Uh, four teams that are going to win trophies for the rest of the year after this. So this was potentially another four, if if not three other teams could have won trophies. So yeah, definitely disappointing that that we're possibly not going to have uh, four finals across the divisions. And Joe as well, like when we look at, I suppose, the dominance of Dublin uh, within the championship, like for a lot of teams in two, three and four, this would have been their only realistic chance of winning a trophy. And I suppose for them players, it might be hard to take. Yeah, and then look at for the players more so. I think management would be just delighted, like actually maybe a le- one less game, you know, reduced down in injuries, and, and that's an issue with a lot of teams at the minute, unfortunately. So I think I think for management they'll be delighted they're just one game bang back back promoted or I was safe from relegation, and that that's what they'd be looking at. Yeah, but for players it, it is obviously it's um it's always nice to get to the final, especially after a, le- a league run and, and you, you've you've done well, like it's. Okay, and it's, it's obviously only hopefully going to be this year, and we, we'll be able to get back to normality next year. But it's um, oh, it's frustrating for players, and I think players have had a lot of pulling and dragging over the last sort of 16, 18 months. So it's they, they probably <laughs> they probably feel like it barred the whole time. And, but it's um, oh look, obviously the fixtures schedule have tried to tighten things up and um, to work that through the inter county championship, and then obviously get the the club championship and club players. Um, Picture of madness sorted out. So it's um look, it is that's the way things are and GA sort of to make these decisions. And sometimes as we spoke about, the, you know, there isn't a whole lot of thinking when it comes to it and um, the organization of and, and how it affects the players more so because I think at the end of the day, I think the players are the ones who are usually last thought of. So it's uh it's just a bit unfortunate, unfortunately. Well, uh party for to look ahead uh, to some of the games uh, in Division 1 in the league semi-final um, Kerry and Tyrone and Fitzgerald Stadium at 5 o'clock on Saturday live on TG Car uh, this is definitely a game all Gaelic football supporters all across the country are looking forward to it because there's been a lot of hype particularly about Kerry and Tyrone this year there is definitely, I suppose. Look, Kerry have been in some very strong performances. <clears throat> Obviously, led by David Clifford, and then look, Tyrone, the new management have been going reasonably well, like yeah. So I just think 
I think probably there's a bit more maybe hype to this kind of fixture now it's because of the time of year do you know what I like so like we're kind of it's unusual where you know it's you're having a a game with something at stake with two high profile teams so close to championship do you know what I like so I just think it's um as much as there's a disappointment on regards to in some divisions no league finals but I just think regards preparation for championship whether it's Tyrone or Kerry this is an ideal fixture like and I just think I'd agree with you like just from a neutral point of view you know, it's not that I've a whole lot of love for Kerry, Kerry teams or Kerry people, but just as a fixture in itself, it's, it would be someone you'd be, you'd be looking forward to. Do you know what I So, um, yeah, it'd be interesting, but it's, I suppose it's, it's going to be hard one to call. And Danny, uh, the most intriguing thing, I suppose, about Kerry and Tyrone, there's still question marks over Kerry's backs and there's still question marks over Tyrone's style. So, and with the two of them coming up against each other this weekend, that those question marks should be answered. Yeah, I think uh, Paulie was uh, was spot on when he says it's the time of year. It's the time of year that you would normally be synonymous with uh, championship football, and it has that type of feel to it. Uh, I think from Tyrone's perspective, they're kind of growing into the management team of Duhar and uh, Logan, so it'll be, you know, I've said this before here that. Galway, when Porg Joyce took over, it was very much let's go on the front foot, and they paid the price in a number of high-profile games where they were they were beaten out the gate and beaten quite heavily by by half time. So Tyrone will want to uh, adapt. They'll want to, I suppose, change their style, but within reason, um, do it in a in a slower in a slower style. Um, yet you know, obviously, try to push on. You know, there's no. There's no point in throwing the baby out with the bathwater as far as as that's concerned with thrown because at the end of the day they have been knocking their their boats in the last latter stages of the championship. So it's about tweaking their style to get the best out of the likes of McKenna, McCurry, um uh, obviously Callum McShamley comes back in. Uh, yes, carries defensively, you know, there have been a lot of raised eyebrows and question marks about them. However, you know, I would say that those question marks were raised more so when they played Dublin rather than anybody else. And and the fact is that they're not going to play Dublin every week. Yes, they're they're going to be pushing and stuff like that. Um, when you look at the competition within within Munster, they're not going to be playing the the quality that Dublin have. So I still think on a man to man basis, collectively, Kerry are as strong as anybody else. Bar, bar, bar the dubs there so I, I think that you know I just see this as probably probably favour and carry to a certain extent Um, I do fancy them because of Clifford Sean O'Shea and some of those some of those really really top class players that they have on the form that they have so you know yes it'll be very interesting viewing and there is that championship feel as Paulie said said to it Yeah and with Kerry as well uh, Neil like Tyrone could go back to a bit of an old side here, revert the numbers back because I suppose that's something Kerry haven't really come up against. Um, they came up against an attack and go side, and we all know what happened there. And then just done enough against Ross Common. So Tyrone probably will try and frustrate Kerry here for long periods. Yeah, I think as Danny said, for Tyrone, uh, you know, as they adopted a new management team, it's going to be about tweaking their style rather than, uh, you know, completely uh, doing, doing a 360 turn from where they were at. Um, you know, Tyrone, war, yeah, well, maybe, you know, you look back to the other 2018, they were probably comprehensively beaten by Dublin in the end that day. But, you know, you look at the first 20 minutes of that game, the system Tyrone were playing uh, had them at a pretty high level um, and it wasn't that they were a million miles off. You know, I think um, the system they were playing as well was built around the, the players that they had. It was built to suit the players that they had, you know, that, that getting men behind the ball. And, uh, you know, personally, uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen them a few times um, and when they counter-attacked, when they did turn over teams uh, from that setup, you know, they were, they were devastating. And, you know, a, a very enjoyable team to watch. Or Super Eight game, possibly 2018, where uh, you know they just they just held held Donegal at bay, held them at bay. Then down the home stretch, last 10 or 15 minutes, they really used those runners some deep to open them up. So I don't think they're going to completely move away from from uh, from that setup that they had under the guys. But yeah, definitely, um, in line with what Danny said, there they'll uh, they'll tweak 
tweak what they were doing for a number of years and, and maybe, like we've seen a lot of teams do this year, uh, probably uh, try and introduce the kick pass uh, into, the, into their game when it's on and Curry are possibly the type of team that will give you an opportunity uh, to do that against them. But um, I think like most Division One teams and or any teams with aspirations of, of winning the Provincial Championship or winning All-Ireland, as I'm sure Tyrone uh, definitely have had over the last number of years, I'm sure they do have this year, um, they're not just going to play one way. They're going, they're going to have to have more than one way of playing in their armory. And, uh, any of those top Division One teams, if, if they need to go defensive, they'll go defensive. Uh, they'll have they'll have the players in their armory to to go uh, to go on a full court press or to attack when, when the opportunities are there. But it'll be very naive for for a manager or a management team in the Tyrone, as is the case in Tyrone, to come in and say, okay, this this is our idealistic view of how we're going to play the game, and no matter what the opposition, we're going to do that. So, I think you'll definitely see sort of a nuanced approach from from Tyrone this again, and it's it's what makes that game particularly interesting too is, is how Tyrone will. Uh, Will match up against uh, against some of the, the the Curry attackers who we know are obviously probably generational talents in in, uh, in the David Clifford instance, but some of the best in the country throughout that forward line. So yeah, that's that's going to make it a hugely interesting game. Yeah, and Joe as well. With Kerry having home advantage, and I suppose still in the COVID times, it definitely does have them at an advantage. But do you think Tyrone being tested in all of their three games? Could be a factor in this game as well. Um, yeah, obviously it's um it, it does bring out character and you know sort of especially with the type of games that've been played. Some some teams have got straight into a hundred mile an hour. Tyrone, as we've known, are a good league team. They were always very consistent across the years. So you know, I wasn't surprised that they were going to be shown as well. Um, you know, I, I just think with Kerry, and I, I know there's no supporters down in. Well, there only might be a, a hundred, or there'll be a couple. There might a few, be a few more that might sneak in. But um, okay, traveling down, you know, just the organization of it, and it, it just it's not as organized as it would be on a, on a normal fixture. So it's um, yeah, it, it will favor Kerry. I think Kerry going into the game. I think they rested a few of the lads the last day. You know, they had the, the benefit of being able to do that. Um, but I think. Tyrone forward line will actually test the Kerry full back line um, and the half half forward the half back line as well. You know, and we spoke about the defensive structure of Kerry and where what way they're going to work it. So it, it'll give them a good idea where they're at. They've, they've, they obviously have tried to change stuff um, after the Dublin game and, and, and try and tighten things up. But I don't know if they've done enough to be honest um, to what they will need to win an All Ireland this year. Um, like from midfield up, yes. They're very strong. Their forward line is exceptional, and I don't think their own full back line would be able to manage, or even their back line in general would be able to cope with the carry forward line. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think their own will try and move the quick ball and, and try and keep to that style of long kick pass moving in. And, and, and they've watched obviously the carry defense over the last couple of months and said, Where can we get that carry? And where can we put the pressure on? Because as you've seen, there's goals to be got against carry. And, and if you can do that, you put the pressure on. Um, you're at home in the semi-final and um, next thing is things that start going against you. You know, that's that's the stuff that will sort of test the carry lads. And they're mentally quite strong when, when you look at the type of players that they have. You know, tight games, they always try to usually make the right decisions. And it's um, it's going to be interesting. But I think it's, um, I, I think Kerry will probably... Probably four or five points in the end, but it's um, it, it will be an interesting tactical battle, especially if Tyrone go at them and, and see how Kerry can cope with them. The next semi final is in Kingspan, Breffany Park at quarter past seven on Saturday between Dublin and Donegal. And really, Polly, for Donegal to be competing in this game, they're going to want to have Michael Murphy back, they're going to want to have Oshin Gallum back, like to. I suppose to compete with Dublin, Donegal has to be a full strength, really. Yeah, but as, as far as where I don't, I don't think Michael Murphy is going to make the game. So I, I think it's just unfortunate because I suppose even again from a neutral perspective, if he was available, then the kind of the intrigue would be would be all right. There's a lot of talk about Donegal the last couple of years, but even like how, how good are they? So this would be a barometer now, like that you know what, how, um, of where they are now. But then, irrespective of how they perform at the weekend. There's always going to be the situation. Well, Michael Murphy wasn't playing, 
what difference would he make? So I just think it's a pity that, that he's not going to be available. But look, we discussed um, previously when he got injured, like how it gave an opportunity for somebody younger forward to step up. So look, there's no better day to step up when you're playing the, the Art Ireland champions, you know. But look, uh, you know, I suppose... I don't want to overplay the Michael Morphy factor, but look, we all know what a huge influence he is in that team. And I just think, irrespective of how much other players might improve, look, I just think that, look, there's only going to be one winner in that game next weekend. And, um, you know, it's going to be Dublin, like, irrespective, you know. So um, it's just, again, it's such a pity that Morphy won't be available. And Danny, um, like, we've talked about the role Michael Murphy's been playing for Donegal in the last few years. Like, how did Donegal approach this game now on Saturday against Dublin? Um, pray that Michael Mor- pray that Michael Murphy uh, covers in time. So I would always put uh, I would describe uh, Mickey Murphy's influence and in, in Donegal akin to, to Messi's in Barcelona. The only difference between Messi and Mickey Murphy is that Messi can't kick the ball over the bar from 50 metres and uh, and Mickey Murphy can, you know. So I would, I would, Mickey taking Mickey Murphy out also has an effect on the likes of Paddy McBurdy. And McBurdy, you know, relies as a, I suppose, an out and out finisher, uh, relies on Mickey Murphy carrying the ball, breaking the lines through tackles, coming off his shoulder, also his, his, his vision. Um, so when, when you take Mickey Murphy out of that team, you're it's a fact of, you know, you're effectively reducing Donegal's options from 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 scores, from free kicks, from you know, as a target man, from kick place kickouts. Um, so I, th- I don't think we can underestimate that their fact. How do Donegal go about stifling this this Dublin four? Like I th- I think it's about going back into, um, into that very structured defence. It's about you know, playing 14 or 15 men behind the ball and tracking Dublin runners, I think that's the best way that that you're going to have to live with a uh, Dublin team. Dublin will find a way, there's no doubt about that. They will play through the hands, they'll play it ugly if they have to, they'll find a way, very, very smart in possession. But I think Donegal are really going to have to frustrate them with, uh, you know, with hitting really quickly on the counter-attack and going back to, I suppose, what made Donegal very, very hard to play against, and that that is that that really defensive kind of negative game. That's what they're going to have to drag Dublin down into. And it's unfortunate. It's not something I would love to see, or something I would, I would obviously aspire to watch or play in. But damn, is it effective? And uh, I, I, I think that Donegal are going to have to go go and do that to to get a result. You know, but listen, they could surprise you and go go out and go toe to toe with Dublin. But you know, they gotta look at it as a as a preparation for an Ulster Championship, as preparation for for an, an eye down the line for when the when they do meet if 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 Donegal can make it out of Ulster, which I, which I think they will. And Danny, obviously, uh, Jim McGuinness's comments have uh, gained a lot of attraction this week about calling Dublin one of the most defensive teams out there. Like, what did you make of that? Danny seems to be gone there. Um, so I'll, I'll come to you, Neil, about it. Um, Jimmy Guinness's comments um, this week, obviously gaining a lot of attraction within the GA public about calling Dublin one of the most defensive teams. But did you think he had a point that Dublin do drop numbers back when they don't have the ball? Can be defensive. They can be defensive when they, when required. I suppose it's their ability to switch to that kind of way again, which must makes them such a good team. Like, sorry, Potter. Potter. Yeah, J- J- Jimmy said that Dublin are the most defensive team at the minute. That's that. It, it's, it's a fair comment from. Athletically, they have the personnel that can get back into that defensive shape, but they don't actually seem that defensive because, again, the, them athletes are able to get back up the pitch and get into a structured attacking shape quicker than every other team in the country. Like I know, Jesus, even I was playing myself, I would love them in 
30 yards further up the pitch at times on a transition if the legs would have allowed you like but some of the athletes that don't have are absolutely phenomenal like the ground that they can cover and, and you know when they do turn over the ball the shape that they can get back into so yeah I can I can definitely see where Jim McGinnis is coming from that like they're not immune to getting 13, 14 behind the ball but just when, when they need to attack then uh, just how they can get bodies up the pitch is phenomenal as well Yeah but they, I think they do it in that space it's when needed rather than that's the tactic, if you know what I mean. Like, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that there is times that they will flood that back and they'll have a full, they'll sit 13, 40 men behind the ball. And we've seen it in Crow Park and Cluxton will be the only one in, inside the, the inside the defensive line. And it's like, it's it, it's just, if, if you're looking at Donegal, they went out as a tactic to play ultra defensive and try and create up and obviously transition into the forward lines. Um, I think Dublin have just they can do it when needed, but I think there's a lot more to them, and you know they can attack at pace and get back back up. And I think their their whole mantra is to try and play attack and football and free flow and football. But when needed, I think it's more that they, they go into that defensive setup as well. And Joe, uh, a good point you raised there. But you think for Dublin, I suppose when they are defensive, is that they have players back and they all know what to do. And, rather than just when you see some blanket defences of American space, really? I, I think it's it's some of the teams when they're playing against Dublin that just go ultra-defensive and they could have 40 men back and there's no actual, as you were saying, there's no structure. They'll just sit back and sit back and, and try and frustrate, but there's no... There'll always be a time, especially when... It's, it's usually teams that try and set up against Dublin because they're obviously trying to slow them down, you know, take out the influence of the likes of Kieran Kilkenny looping in, uh, Paul Mannion, Dean Rock, and getting them scores in around the D area, and that's that's what they try to do to stop them running. And um, but it's it's just because I think a lot of the teams that that they're probably lacking the players to be able to compete against Dublin. That they they need to do that to try and stop the influence of the Dublin team. So it's um, look, that's that's not Dub Dublin's fault. You know, teams have and, and so teams of certain players can play a certain way, and I think. The Jim Jim uh, McGinnis comment. He had players. It's for for them to win. He got the best of all them players at that time, and the defensive structure and the the sort of the quick counter attack that would suit suit the type of players that they had. You could use Michael Murphy, leave him up top. You know, bad and them them boys. You know, when you got up front up to the the forward line, massive impact. But then they had to flood back, try and obviously create that opportunities for the lads up front. So it's a uh, I suppose it's horses for courses and you've got to use what players you have on, on your squad to maximise your, your chances of success. So, sorry, just on that, I know I, I, I stepped out there, the same girl was hit me, Paul, but on the defensive on the defensive element, don't, when, when we played uh, Donegal in the 2012 um, Ulster final, and they obviously went on to win the All-Ireland that year, their organisation was on a different level than something that we experienced previous to that and obviously we, we had been playing I've been at the top table for a while and all McCork obviously Cork had, had uh, won their All-Ireland and stuff but even in that state, but their organisation their communication and their levels of fitness were at a, a level there that obviously that uh, was that was different to, than what we were playing at and um, yes they're really brilliant players but they knew exactly where they were going and how they were going about their business there and then those particular games but I, I think where McGuinness made the mistake was um, you know in, tw in tw 2014 invariably if they had went out and, and really went for Kerry um, I think they would have won another All-Ireland because in the semi-final against Dublin or it was the quarter-final when, when they actually were the last team to beat them they, they were pretty expansive and they had tactically, they were spot on. I think Donegal had the players and they had the skill and the ability to go and win an All-Ireland. Uh, All and I feel like in, in that All-Ireland final against Kerry, they definitely played within themselves and it was a terrible game. But um, and, and I do get McGuinness's point when he says that Dublin are defensive. Dublin are prepared to, as Joe said, play ugly. They're prepared to track their men and go 15 men behind the ball. But I think 
I think there's they're not as obvious about it as as other teams. They're prepared to press a lot higher up the field than the likes of Donegal, and I think that's the difference. Donegal were quite prepared to press within their own half to allow teams to give up the kick out to do all that. Dublin aren't prepared to give up the kick out. They're prepared to press, but uh, and they're prepared to to send two or three boys to press in in the attacking half of the field, whereas other teams are just just not obvious about that, that they're, they're prepared to allow teams, they're prepared to give up the kick out and, and to play it in their own defensive half, which is obviously a, a horrible way to play it, but sorry for interjecting that. And with Dublin as well, uh, Neil, like even the players they've been missing in the league, they, they just have this conveyor belt that keeps coming, even Colin Baskell coming in the last day, like Dean Rock might even be back the next day, but it's it's just showing that their strength and depth is only getting stronger every year. Ah, yeah, absolutely, and you know that's a huge testament to the work that's went on in Dublin, probably over the last fifteen or twenty years. You know, in developing these players, you know, from primary schools level through the clubs. Uh, so that yeah, the conveyor belt is there now. Obviously, the, the playing population they have. I don't correct me. Maybe Paul, you might know more, but maybe Cork or possibly Johnny County in Ireland that can rival them when it comes to like uh, playing population numbers. But um, you know, some some of the players that they've developed um, are, are just top quality. You know, you can see two or three emerging every year. But I think a huge advantage that they have uh, also on top of that is those players are coming into a winning team and there's a lot of, uh, I suppose, tribal knowledge within that, within that group as well. And, you know, it's the players are probably, you know, two or three players are taking one of the new lads under their wing every year. And, you know, they're maybe going through little tactical nuances with them, uh, you know, maybe helping them develop some of their, some of their own individual skills, um, you know, outside of training sessions, you know, uh, setting that standard, so for the new guys coming in, they know that the bar that they have to reach in terms of their knowledge of the game plan, in terms of their uh, their own like uh, development as a player, that bar is like is very very high. And uh, so if if they've got to a stage where they're good enough to get into the Dublin team, they're obviously a very very good player. But you know I think there's definitely an advantage of they're building year on year. They're they're putting strengths uh, strengths on top of previous strengths every year. Whereas you see in a lot of other teams, they're maybe starting from, from ground zero, either with new management teams or after a, a tough defeat to probably, you know, a Dublin the year before. And they're going, okay, how do we rebuild? Where do we start from? Um, so, you know, it's you're probably not comparing apples with apples when you look at guys coming into the Dublin team. It's, it's, a, it's a product of, you know, probably 15, 20 years of work underage. And then also they're building on the strengths that they're having each year at senior level as well. And, and, and that's hugely important for, for young lads coming in. And probably was a gap that actually, uh, now that you mentioned it, and probably Cork uh, around the time, Paddy and that group of players that he had finished up, they probably lost too many players from a successful team all, all around at one time. And probably um, not having not having some of those guys around for the young, young guys to, to learn off uh, what was a gap in, in Cork for a number of years as well. And Joe, really, I think we can all only expect a Dublin win here. Yeah, look, it's it's probably expected to win it from the outset, no matter who they were going to play. So um, they just have so much quality across the pitch. Um, bringing lads in and out, they don't even have that first team that will probably start championship in any of the games that they've played so far. And you know, they, they just do it so professionally and just get the job done and there's no real messing around with them. Um, I made a comment on actually I think it was one of the lads the Dublin lads was doing a Scully I think was doing an interview after the game and it was just literally robotic it was like, yeah no no yeah we're great it's like, great to have the game you know he didn't even answer any of the questions he, it was just let's get to the next game and um, and that's the way they are they, they probably don't even like when you, when you think of how many games they've won how long they've gone unbeaten you know it's, it's just incredible and to keep keep going and keep going and keep going. And there's games they could have lost over the last sort of couple of years. And they just eke out um, a performance and, and, and get a result when it's needed. And, you know, I, I can probably going to be an easy, an easy win for them at the weekend, unfortunately. Um, like, especially with Michael Murphy missing, you know, McBurty is going to have to take a lot of the pressure off 
a lot of the players, the younger players coming in. Um, but I, I just think Dublin are going to have way too much for them. And, you know, that their pace and sort of, you know, they're extremely clever footballers as well. You know, they, they, they all read the game quite well. You know, they know when to do the right thing. Um, same as the Kerry boys, you know, and that's what happens with top quality footballers. They make the right decision, you know, when on the pressure and, and at the right moment. So it's, um, yeah, look, it's, it's unfortunate, as, as Paulie was saying, that Michael Murphy and these boys aren't around to, to actually push and see where Donegal are at come championship. So it's, um, oh, look, it, it's, it's going to be a, a tough task for Donegal. And it's, um, like, to be honest, if you're going to punish Dublin for what happened, they probably should have give a home game to Donegal, to be honest. Um, it probably maybe would have helped. Um, and, you know, you know, you've got to punish them for what they've done. And that probably might have given an extra boost to Donegal. So, it would have been nice to maybe um, give them that home game, but we, you know, expect some normal things from the GA sometimes, and or make them make them play with twelve players. Too. <laughs> <laughs> then it'd be really demoralising if they bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So with them two semi finals, only if Dublin and Tyrone win, there'd be a Division One League final. Um. In the relegation games, Monaghan playing Go in Clonus at three forty five and. Stanley, have to come to you since you've been writing off Galway since uh, day one. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I keep writing them off, they're probably one of all the Irons. <laughs> you'll have to, you'll have to get rid of me. Um, <laughs> no, listen, I, I tell you, I've been very impressed with. I suppose I've been impressed with the results that Monaghan have turned out this year. You know, when when you look at it, uh, when you look at it, they drew with Throne, they drew with Tony Gall, um. And you would be thinking to yourself, like Monaghan, you would have thought would have been, you know, you have an aging squad there, you have an aging Conor McManus, you have, you have guys there that have stepped away and stuff. Um, and, you know, I know Conor McCarthy come through, you got a hat trick against Tony Gall and stuff like that. But really, after that, they, they wouldn't have a huge amount of household names. Listen, Darren Hughes, Kieran Hughes, you still have those guys. Now going about Carl O'Connell, a super player, totally underrated, but a super player. But bar that, you wouldn't have a huge amount of uh, household names there that can go and not like a Clifford or a Shane Walsh or Con O'Gallan, you know. And and for them to be doing what they're doing, for them to get those results is really a testament to the depth of character that they have, the mental fortitude that they've had, and the reason why they've stayed in Division One. They won the longest serve in Division One. Uh, teams there and uh, it's a real credit to to how they've called the resources together and despite the change in management you would even think maybe if it's not going well there would be a lull or whatever but that hasn't been the case and and uh, you know there's I have to say you have to admire what Monaghan are doing there um, I do fancy them to beat Galway and I fancy them because of that character and the resolve and the determination that they show and they're just their will to win uh, their 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 ability to stay in games. Um, and again, as as you've said, Paul rightly, I've huge reservations about this Galway team. Don't get me wrong; the result against Roscommon was was a decent result. Um, I thought the I thought Roscommon would turn them over. Um, uh, but I still think that uh, without Shane Walsh, without his his leadership there, without his ability. Galway are a very, very average side and uh, I just would fear for them from a defensive, from a collective defensive position, maybe individually they're, they're good all over the field um, Galway always produce good footballers but as a unit I would just fear that um, when it comes to that bit, that fortitude that character that you need to really dig in on a on a tough day I think Monaghan have been there they've been to the well and they've done it and they've got out of trouble I'm not so sure if Galway have, and uh, you know this weekend I think I would I would have to put them on and now. And for Galway as well, Paddy Damien Comer is uh, going to be out again this weekend, and that's a massive blow really because the the majority of the scores more than likely now they're going to have an over reliance on Shane Walsh this weekend, and I'm sure Monaghan are already planning for that. Yeah, and I think definitely like all right. Damien, say not having Damien Comer is not the same as not having Michael Murphy for Donegal, but still you think back to maybe in towards the end of Kevin Walsh's reign, 
Homer would have been the talisman up front, like, and you know, he was he was a leader as well as being a score getter, like, you know, and um, yeah, look, it puts a bit of, more of an onus on um, Shane Walsh, but just uh, I know Danny touched on the point there, but maybe about you know, question the character maybe of the Galway team, like, but I suppose a lot of these players when they were under Kevin Walsh, just like, I know they brought through some young fellas now, but still the core group is still there. They they had that ability to 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 achieve good good consistent performances. Again, maybe not pleasing on the eye for certain pundits or whatever, but like but so like I think that it's a case of I think there is there is good characters there, but just whatever way, whether it's their preparations, whether it's you know, etc. What what's their game plan, etc. Do you know I mean? like I just don't think um there's gaps in that, like you know, like we hinted about Dublin and their ability to be flexible or adaptable depending on what's happening in the game or depending who they're playing. But I think whether that seems to be like Galway have gone from maybe being very organised to more playing more traditional, and suddenly have suffered a couple of bad defeats, and now we're kind of you know they're kind of caught in the middle somewhere. Like so, look, I where I, I see it as a kind of a if Galway get a result, then it, like it's going to be a close game, respect to how they play. But if they get a result. Even if it's only a one point win. I just think that's something for them then to kind of they're on you know to build on then regards um looking ahead to championship. Do you not know kind of like so? But it's a case of again, man will ask the question and you know, time will tell if I suppose the question for Galway is if things don't go well, as I said, if, if they go behind a couple of points in the period of the game early on, what'll happen? And that's the question to be answered. And with Monaghan as well, Paulie, Danny mentioned they've got good results, but they haven't won a game yet, and it's Obviously, vital for them. They've been in Division One now for quite a while, and bringing in through a lot of these youngsters that want to have them play in Division One football. But at the same time, they're going to want to get a win under Vanty before they get into Championship. Yes, they they they'll want to win. No, I suppose, but also it, it it just depends on the narrative in the group or what what message is being delivered. Like you know, at the end of the day, right? If you're a group, and we we know say Manon haven't started some of the more experienced players, the young fellas coming through. So suddenly they, they step back and go, one second, oh, we've competed against Tyrone, we've competed against Donegal, we've got a draw right, we haven't got a win, but, but, but we've competed. Like, So, like, you know what I mean? I'm not saying, like, as I said, a draw isn't good enough, you want to win, but I just think, there's, and I, I would have questioned Manhattan a few weeks ago, um, but no, I, 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 like, they'll want to win, like, but I, I, I still think they're kind of, a, they're in a great place now, um, heading into championship, and I, like, say if Manhattan end up losing by a point, at the weekend, do I see it as the end of the world? I don't. They're still competitive against, you know, still against a good side. But the one factor maybe I didn't acknowledge a few weeks ago is the impact of Donny Buckley. Do you know, like he's getting involved and right, say Banty convinced him to get on board. Like, but you know, Donny Buckley's been involved with Mayoff. You look, we all know for a couple of years, involved with Kerry, very successful um, coach. So at the end of the day, like, you know, I don't think he'd have been getting involved long travel up to, to Manning unless he knew there was something to work with. Again, maybe young players are aware, maybe not familiar with, but I just think, you know, so I think maybe there is talent there coming through that we're not aware of or we're just finding out about. And plus matched in with his ability and experience as a coach, I think that's maybe a factor why that um, Manon have done maybe better than expected over the last number of weeks. The other um, relegation playoff then is in the athletic grounds between Armand and Ross Common uh, on Sunday at three o'clock. Neil, a vital game for both sides here, obviously, for Maz development, it's huge for them to stay up in Division One. And Ross Common have really been the yo yo team from Division Two to Division One in the past few years. Um, yeah, Ross Common have, uh, have found themselves in that sort of limbo. And, you know, you probably, I think, me or another team uh, probably with potential to, to slip into that. Uh, I know Cavan have went down to three, but, you know, they, they went up as well and came straight back down. But, yeah, it, there is a. Uh, there's probably you know three or four teams um, outside the top uh, five or six in the country there that, that will bounce between uh, divisions one and two. Kildare probably also in that mix, but yeah, it's a funny one. Uh, I think you know what Kieran McGinley has done in Armagh has probably you know attracted a bit of uh, skepticism over the last few years, or you know have they been making progress? But you know from from the outside looking in, I think you could definitely see their game has been developing. He's been uh, adding some quality players, developing, you know, you can see individually the players are improving uh, within the group as well. The players seem to really enjoy, uh, you know, talking out from, uh, which is huge. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been very impressed at how Armagh have, have probably slowly developed over the last number of seasons. Obviously, their supporters 
would have liked to see that happen a lot quicker. But it's it's very difficult when when you're in a tough uh, a tough Ulster Championship, and you know he was McGinney was taking on a group uh, that hadn't uh, hadn't much success, or and you know there hadn't been a huge amount of underage success in Armagh either. So I've been very impressed with the progress they've made, even if it hasn't looked as as obvious from the outside, and. You know, I just I would fancy them. I think their motivation for Armagh to to stay in Division One is going to be huge. Whereas I think with Roscommon, given that sort of yo-yo status that they they've found themselves, um, I suppose enjoying or enduring um, over the last number of years, I just don't know if the motivation would be as strong. I think for Roscommon, if they were to go down to Division Two, I think that they could uh, they could handle that. They'll be easily able to get refocused on a kind of championship coming up in the next few weeks. Whereas for Arma, I think the players, you know, they'll have enjoyed really getting a taste of it this year. It's probably not been the Division One that they would have probably hoped for in terms of it's been a mini Ulster championship. They've only played Ulster Ulster teams. Uh, I think there'll be a huge motivation for Arma to to stay in Division One and get a crack at you know the likes of Donegal, the likes of Kerry next year. Um, but I think for that group of players as well, and what Kieran McGinney is doing, it's crucial to uh, to stay in Division One because um, I think you definitely you become a product of your environment. And I think the Armagh they have the raw materials uh, to be relatively successful or to sustain at that level, but they just need to get some uh, some exposure to it for for a sustained period of time. So I think um, yeah, for Armagh, huge motivation to try and stay in Division One and stabilize at that level for two or three years and I think that would enable them to kick on and um, you know possibly compete for an Ulster Championship but definitely even outside of that if they were to to fall into a backdoor whatever whatever system we're left with from next year they would be dangerous opponents for, for anybody in the country if they can get a, a year or two at Division 1 level I think. And Joe as well there like as Neil's saying like there's, there's so many positives for Matt to take from the league but Really, it does all come down to Sunday for them now to stay in Division One and keep progressing. Yeah, and like I've probably knocked them a wee bit this year about not getting that big win and not sort of getting that confidence to try and compete with them top teams, and they've had chances, but they just didn't see the games out, unfortunately. And I think this could be a game that I know Ross Common probably aren't at the level of sort of you know, Kerry's, Dublin's, Tyrone's, and um, but not far off it, and. You know, it might sort of give confidence into the squad about that you can actually compete at the top level. And look, I'm, when you when you look at Armar, you know, you, and you look at McGinney, he, he also knows that they need to improve from last year. That's why he brought here and he's brought McKeever in as well. And and these lads are obviously there to progress the team. And you know, Donny's only there probably about three or four months at this stage. You know, so his his impact will only be seen probably, and you can slowly start seeing it. Um, but it's not going to be automatic, you know, it's going to be brought in and obviously through the championship. So um, I do like the the way they're playing, they're moving the ball a lot quicker um, into the forward line, you know, creating scores, score, scores from all over the pitch. Um, a lot of talented footballers that, and you're probably actually seeing it, how good they are now that they actually will allow the game to flow and, and create the chances for these players to showcase their talents. And it, it's great to see. And I, I do fancy them to beat Roscommon. I think Roscommon are just in this sort of, you know, Andy Cunning has done a good job with the team that he has, the players that he has. Um, I just think that probably on a downward curve, whereas I'm are on an upward curve, um, as Neil was saying, that that yo-yo team that will come up and down, and he mentioned me as well. And we, you know, hopefully with a bit of luck, we'll go, we'll go back up. Um, and that's just the type of team to get that confidence in the players that you'll have. You know, hopefully then one year you, you'll get a bit of luck and you you compete in, in Division One and. and and that'll give you the confidence going into a championship, you know, and that's that's what sort of the, the goal is. And if um, if Roscommon can keep with them, I think that defensively Roscommon just are struggling a wee bit. Um, I don't know if they'll be able to hold that armor full forward line the way they're playing at the minute. They're scoring like 110, 119 at every game. And, you know, it's a, it's a wide range of scores from the, the three lads inside. So it's, um, it's going to be interesting, but I, I just... I'd like to see Armara trying to get back up and get that win that they need to get the conference going and, and, and drive things on because, you know, it's good to see Armara back competing after being obviously out of contention for the last number of years. And it's, um, you know, they have the players now and it's great to see that um, the style of football they're playing is um, is a lot more open and expansive as well. 
I think yeah. some things in this game as well, maybe Danny might have a better insight into it, would be uh, the influence that Stephen Poacher might have on, on Roscommon lining up against Armagh. Or, uh, is there any interest in local local history there on, on the cross-border rivalry? I think from the, the little bits I've seen in Roscommon this year, I haven't seen much that Stephen Poacher has brought to it versus what he brought to Carlo. So is there a few tricks up the sleeves that we might see this again or coming into championship? I, I honestly I, I honestly don't believe that that Stevie well uh, it doesn't look like he's unduly influenced um Roscommon to an extent where they've done a they've done a Carlo or suppose Carlo were working you're working with the two different types of players there, uh two different teams that are in a probably different courses and two different levels of ability, I would say. Uh, obviously Roscommon are a better team than Carlo and far more for further down the road in, in, in that journey and and uh, you know for me Roscommon it's difficult it's difficult to know what Roscommon represent they're obviously a lovely footballing team and, and they do go forward and they have liked to play the game really well and Cullingham has done to be fair Joe, Joe spot on Cullingham has done a really really good job but it's hard to know what they really represent at this stage and, and they are one of those teams as you say Neil, that they are a product of their environment. They've got better because they've played at that better levels, but they are going to, they are just missing that one or two players that, as I said, not everybody can be blessed with a Shane Walsh or, or David Clifford, but, you know, the, as, a, as, a, as a team, they're, they're a good, steady team. Can they beat Armagh? They probably can. They, they've done a number on them last year uh, when, when Armagh were looking to get, get up and uh, Roscombe and beat them. Um, so they, they'll not fear Armagh. Um, Armagh really, if you look at the games that they played this year, some of the scores and some of the scores from, all, I suppose, throughout the league have been absolutely fantastic. We have been treated to a really brilliant um, uh, league campaign, you could say, and I know the supporters haven't been there to enjoy it, but from, from what I've seen, the score taken from all over have been absolutely fantastic. Um, I think it's now or never for Armagh. If they're going to, if they're going to, uh, I suppose, I've always, I've been tipping them this last five years to probably pull off a big game um, to get a big result. Roscommon isn't a big game. Uh, you know, it's it's not a big team. Um, when we look at Tyrone, uh, Donegal, Kerry's, Dublin, but it is a big match. So it's going to be a test of them. And to be fair to them, they have got good results this year. Um, you know, obviously the one against Tyrone was disappointing, but they'll, they'll want to have beat Tyrone. But I, I think, uh, put your, uh, the, the down Armagh rivalry is more of a friendly one than, rather than a toxic more. The Tyrone Armagh one will be more toxic than the down Armagh one. But I, I can't see anything that any other coach wouldn't see from Armagh. They have ability, they can go forward, they play the game the right way. I, my fear for Armagh has been and always will be their defensive discipline, their how they allow teams to get a run on them, to score goals, to score big scores, and to concede in such a sports 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 space of time. They concede one three or one four, and obviously they've raced in the leads this year as well, and haven't closed out games. So it's that defensive discipline that Armagh is going to fall back on. Um, but if they if certainly it's a, it's a good it's a good campaign if they can retain their division one status, I would certainly say that. Moving on to uh, division two, um, Claire faced Mayo uh, in Ennis on Sunday at one forty five. Um, Paddy, I think everyone would really like to see Claire progress to the next level. I suppose with Colin Collins being there and taking them from division four to division two, but. It's it's a massive test with Mayo and with the form Mayo are are in at the moment. Yeah, I suppose it's just it's a pity of because of COVID and the restrictions and crowds. I think it'd be the you know it'd be ideal if Cusa Park was packed for you know for this kind of game. Like I think back to maybe three or four years ago, that Mayo competed against Clare in a qualifier game in um in Cusa Park. Now I think for a, definitely around the game, uh, Clare gave him a, a good decent game. Like I suppose look. It's, it's, I suppose it's a great story in a way, and it's a great. It is great. It's, it's recognition deserved for the Clare footballers and 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 Colum for the progress that they've made. But and like it would be brilliant for them, 
personally, like, but I just look, I, I just think there's going to be a bridge too far. Like, you know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, right? If Mayo, if Mayo bring their A game or bring somewhere close to the way they're playing at the moment, or you know, you know, I just think that they're they're just going to be too good, you know. And um, I just think you know, like, Clare have a good spine of a team, but they're kind of obviously they've brought through some good young fellas, but still, I just think overall there's just too much pace and too much ability in in the Mayo team, and you know, like so as I said. There's always a shock in the cards every now and then, and who knows it might happen. But I just look right now. If you ask me to call it, I just it's just, it's just a simple case of, you know, that that, that may or just, are just going to be too good, irrespective of tactics, whatever, etc. Paddy, from previously being involved um, with Clare, obviously, has this progress surprised you at all? Um, this progress surprised me. I just think it's something that's look. It's, this isn't the overnight. Like this, this started in you know in the winter of two thousand and thirteen, where. Colin Kylans had had felt that, like that as far as he was concerned, Clare were good enough to be in Division Two, you know. And then, and like that's at that time, Clare were in Division Four. And like lads, you know here, like it, like it's it's very hard. like you see teams that get out of Division Four, they kind of push on, but it's very hard at times to get out of Division Four because you you've come maybe from a period of not going so well, and it's just it's a battle, like you know. And um, so like. But I suppose what's happened now, you see, is irrespective of the players and, again, irrespective of losing the likes of Gary Brennan's and, and, and Gordon Kelly's, we mentioned a few weeks ago, they just have a, like, there's a there's a culture or there's an environment there where they've had enough success to give them belief every day they go out, no matter who they play. Do you know, like, so, you know, so, like, it's like, like they know, like, Claire, have, we mentioned maybe of um, Manhattan early on about, like, you know, their pride of being in Division 1 and being hard to beat. Well, it, it's, it's, it's kind of something similar now at this stage, you know. And again, as I said, it's not to say it's not about moral victories, like. But Claire, no, they've had enough success. So I suppose your question is: this a surprise? It's not a surprise that they're in a stage where they're competing to get promoted, because again, in the last number of years, in a couple of seasons, give or take, there's a point or two difference between lots of teams whether you're maybe going to be promoted or relegated. So like, it's not a surprise, but at the same time, you know, I just think that's that's their level right now, like. You know, and I don't think I just don't think they're good enough um, to beat to beat Mayo. But I suppose, but also if I haven't been previously involved with him. Like, look, I'd be delighted if they do win. You know, so um, let's see what happens. And like Neil, we talked about Mayo's strength there. Like even James Kerr, who came on the scene um, two years ago against Go in Limerick, he looks back to his best. Darren McHale from Knockmore being called in. Mayo really look like they're trying to develop this panel for later in the year and it's been beneficial in one way that some of the younger players have been able to come in and play Division 2 football. Yeah, and maybe not to repeat myself from earlier, but and to touch back on what I mentioned about Dublin is, you know, the athletes that they have and, you know, I think Mayo have probably realised that to compete with Dublin, they're probably going to need to, to, uh, to match them athletically and they were probably lucky uh, that they had developed a generation of players um, you, you know where they went toe to toe Dublin over the last five or six years guys like you know Shane O'Shea Tom Parsons Donald Vaughan um, obviously Lee Keegan um, Aidan O'Shea you know physically they were able to compete with Dublin around the middle which gives them a platform that no other team in the country had uh, in terms of being able, being able to break even with Dublin um, athletically in the middle of the field so I think Mayo have, have realised that you um, you know, there's there's huge value in, in developing athletes. And you look at some of the younger guys that they've brought in, you know, I think it's Owen McLaughlin. He was previously a champion cyclist. You know, they, they've developed his football skills. You know, they've really improved him as a player. You know, Oshin Mullen, probably not the silkiest footballer uh, in the country, but, you know, an absolutely outstanding talent and doing an unbelievable job for Mayo because or you know hugely helps with, with his uh with his excellent athleticism so um you know the likes of James Kerr, Ryan O'Donoghue then you know while they're maybe not as as strong and powerful as some of the other guys mentioned what they do have is huge speed and um you know that that is uh that's that's a huge thing that Mayo have in their armory is is that uh, that uh, that power and speed you know obviously Paddy Durkin coming from the half back line um, so it's it's one of the things Mayo have that that a lot of the teams in the country aren't, aren't aren't able to match up with, and I think probably you know even that athleticism will even decide this game. I think obviously uh, as a psycho man, I'd love to see Claire beat Mayo, and I, I have huge admiration for uh, for what Colin Collins has done with that uh, that Claire team since he took over in 2013. Absolutely love to see them get to Division One. 
But I can probably see two things happening in this game. Mayo get on top early on and just blow Clare out of the water, you know, maybe go five or six points up and hold them around the game. Or Clare managed to really dig in, do a great job, turn it into a slog, and Mayo just pipped them, uh, pipped them down, down the home stretch. Uh, where you know that that a bit of pace um, and maybe even the fresh legs um, and better athletes coming in from the bench is, is able to have a big impact on the game in the last the last ten or fifteen minutes. So, unfortunately, well, I'd love to see Claire do it, and uh, you know I think uh, they're a team that if, if ever a team deserved to go to Division One, it's Claire. But I just can't see them getting a win over Mayo. I can see them possibly competing with Mayo for. 60 minutes but I just can't see them uh, I can't see them getting a win over the 70 minutes and uh, Joe the other league semi-final between Kildare Mead and Newridge at 2 o'clock on Sunday um, a very hard one to call because it's it's really very hard to know where both of these sides are at yeah and I was only chatting to Brian Farrell the other day and it was a it was sort of discussing that we we actually could go out and win this game, you know, and it was it, it, it was nearly a shock, and we would nearly, it was like and to vote, but we were like, yeah, we, we we can go and win this game, you know, there's no there's no problem, and we um, it's it's going to be tight, you know, they over the last number of years we're probably on on the same level. We could one day, you know, either team could beat each other, so it's um. It's it's going to be interesting. I, I do I do feel confident that we can actually um, win the game. You know, it's great to see Mickey Newman back. He you know as a free taker, we've been struggling through the league for a free taker, and, and it'd be great to have him. Um, obviously, match fitness will be will be an issue with him, but he keeps himself in great shape, and hopefully, it'll be a boost for the squad, and he, he'll be able to drive things on because he's a he's a leader within the squad and. Um, that's what we need at the minute. So look, it's um, I'm 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 pr- I'm quietly confident that we can win the game. Um, obviously Andy will just be doing everything we can just to get back to Division One, and that's that's what that that'll be Andy's main aim. And you know he's blooded a few young lads and new lads in onto the squad this year as well, and even throughout the league. So um, that's a boost. You know, Claire. You know, it, it just, they're just a team that really frustrate me because I love the players that they have. You know, there's some fine footballers, the Flynn's, uh, Feeney, um, you know, and they just, like, on the day, they should be able to compete at the top level. Um, I just don't, want, don't know what it is about them. Um, I'd love to see it because it, it'd be great for Lens the football. Um, and, and, look, they could come out and do a job on us on, on at the weekend, but I just think that we'll have enough and... And Andy will have everyone to the fine to a fine T that will give us the greatest opportunity to win the game, and and and, and that's hopefully that what will happen. But it's um, it no, it's, it's going to be tight. It's it's I don't think it's going to be a pretty game. I think it'll just be obviously with the opportunity to get back to Division One, the two two teams will be quite you know cautious at the beginning, and then the game might open up and it might be a point or two in it. You know? So I I don't see. A big high scoring game it's going to be tight and and it'll be whoever makes makes the most of that in the last 10 or 50 minutes they'll probably come out on top yeah well do we sense Joe that Kildare do have that bit more scoring power up front when you look Kevin Feely's being deployed there the Flynn's Jimmy Highland like there's this huge potential there as you said but it's just like inconsistency like they bet Cork and then they go out the next day and they they lost to Clear in round two of the league. Yeah, and they've probably been trying things as well. Like, you know, they have been moving certain personnel around the team. And I think Jack O'Connor still probably doesn't know his best team. And, and that's an issue as well because we don't they don't have many games to trial out. There was obviously no tra- tra- um, challenge matches to be played before the league. So it's 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 difficult for them to try and get a settled team. Um yeah, look. For, for ourselves, we, we we have a lot of scoring power. You know, you have Jody Morris up front who's playing very well at the minute. You know, I think Brian McMahon will probably come back into the, to the team. Um, possibly Joey or Eamon Wallace might come back. Um, and then you've got the likes of Moss O'Reilly will probably start in full forward. Probably hasn't had his best league campaign, but has the potential to, to go on and do, do some nice things in the full forward line as well. So... We, we, we're probably still mixing around with our own forward line. That's the problem. 
Um, and it's not a settled team like we spoke about free take. We've had seven or eight free takers each game, you know, which is crazy for, for an inter-county team. So I think we need to settle on that. We need to get a settled forward line. Um, you know, I think defensively we're quite strong. We, we have a set platform going forward and, and if we can sort out from a, a forward line, I think, I think you know, that'll do a lot to us winning the game. And uh, Danny, a huge game for uh, Down this weekend, coming up against Leash in Division 2 relegation playoff. Have been lucky enough to source yourself a ticket? <laughs> Hi, I'll, I'll probably see one blown down the street. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, a, um, that's how much appetite there is for watching Down at the minute, uh, Paul, to be honest with you. Um, funny, this, this game reminds me a bit of... Um, this game reminds me but of uh, playing five-a-side soccer with my brother, who, um, my brother, sorry, he, you know, uh, a lot of us are, are you know, well, we could say blessed with a bit of skill, but he's he's not blessed with any skill. And he, he came back after playing um, shite one night and says, I actually didn't play too bad tonight. And we says, yeah, um, you were shite tonight. You just weren't absolutely shite. And this is what, I'm coming to with down. down. Down aren't good at the moment. There's no there's no point in saying that they are. Um obviously leash aren't good either. So it's uh, it's a bit of a race to the bottom um as far as this is concerned, this match is concerned. And while I didn't give them much I didn't give down much hope um against Westmeath. I, I genuinely thought that Westmeath would beat them. Um I sort of you know, on the back of that, when you could see down beating Leash, um, and it's a game that is very, very hard to call. Like, listen, Leash are no world beaters. Um, obviously, they are in a position where they are where they are because of that same scenario. They're no world beaters. So, um, if down are to progress, if this current squad are to find their feet in that division, they're going to have to obviously stay there and try and struggle. Um, struggle through that division for the next couple of years until hopefully we can try and produce uh, the type of players that's needed to to push on into the first division. You know, so um, listen, it's 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 the, I for down. I I do believe that this this game this weekend will will dictate whether they have a good season or a bad season because playing Donegal in an opening round of the championship, given where Donegal are and where we are. It's just probably a step too far for us. Not to say that they can't win. Of course they can. And any on any given Sunday, any team can be uh, can be beaten. But um, I just feel that if they do win this uh, this game this weekend, it could be certainly you know what you, you could say it's job done. It's job done for the year because we, we all hope, you know we would all say that that beating Donegal is just going to be a bit of an ask, you know. And it's obviously hugely important, as you mentioned, for Down to stay up after coming up from Division 3, but for Cork, it would be a huge kick in the teeth if they are beaten by West oh, Westmead this weekend. So, ab- absolutely. How, how Cork have found themselves in this position is really quite staggering for a county of their size, with their, their stature, with the history, with the amount of players that there is in the county. Do you know, it's 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 unbelievable when you when you see how how they've got into this position and you know you would have to say it's of their own making that you know to be beaten an opening game by Kildare, um, you know is obviously is is a is a better better pill to swallow but to go then and and uh, you know not to get two wins for the next two games when they when they, when they knew they were going to be in this position is is hard to fathom you know and i just say you know it would be interesting to hear what party would have to say on it but you know you we've heard this about transition and down are no different you know transition every year transition every year but at what point do you say this isn't a transition this is who we are and i suppose cork are in a scenario where you know really the need they need inspiration, um, whether that comes from a player on the field or somebody coming in from the outside to manage them. Um, you know, how long how long is it since Cork have had an outside manager? 
um, a Jimmy McGuinness type character who can come in and really galvanize a squad and an account. Of. But certainly Cork, for me, are, are just a huge resource that um, don't appear uh, don't appear to be functioning correctly, if you know what I mean. Um, so, it, it, you know, do, should they beat Mass Meat? They should, yeah. Um, will they? Who knows? This is Cork. Yeah, it's, it's just very hard to understand, I suppose. They won an under-20 All-Ireland in the last five years, beating Dublin in that final. A big sponsor like Sports Direct coming in this year, which I'm sure has only helped them and then to be in this position. And a man like Keen O'Neill as well, who's worked with Kerry, he's worked with the Tip Hurlers. And after beating Kerry, I thought there would have been a bit of a bounce, but there doesn't seem to be anything. No one, it kind of, it kind of sums up... Um... It kind of sums up Cork since they've lost, obviously, that, that super team that they had from 2010 and, and further. They've won a number of national leagues and were in a number of all Iron finals. It more or less sums Cork up and where they've dropped to. Um, how, I suppose how far they've fallen. But they had to go to Division 3 and then, obviously, well, they sort of struggled their way out of that even. And, uh, you know, they find themselves now in a battle of relegation. Like, honestly, the, the they, it is hard to fathom. Even last year, when they get a result against Kerry, you think that that would push them to be, you know, to go on and win, win Munster. And then you see Tipperary Tip deservedly turned them over, and they just lacked, they lacked any, nearly they lacked a fight in that game, and a game that they should have really been able to cruise through. Um, and you just, it's just hard to fathom, as I say. The psyche of Cork, um, the psyche of, of what's going on there and why 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 they're kind of going through the motions within the league and championship every year uh, for this last, I suppose, five or six years. Just to briefly then look at um, Division 3, Limerick played Derry, Offaly played Fermanagh. You would expect Derry to get the job. Offaly and Fermanagh should be an interesting one. Uh, yeah. Fermanagh drawn with Longford, though, in their home pitch and Brewster Park doesn't give great signs for this and there seems to be a feel good factor in Offaly with John Mahon at the moment and even Niall McNamee still playing that super sub role Yeah and, and Mahon like is there anybody on the circuit that has had as much experience as Mahon have and you sort of your mind drifts back to the 90s when he when he took Mayo to a couple of uh, all Iron finals and stuff and, and replays and you know Mahon you have to say has has been around a lot of teams, has seen a lot of things, a lot of experience, and for him to to still be motivating players to deliver, um, at at in this time in twenty twenty one, is is a phenomenal feat, and uh, you know I think it will be a step, wee bit step too far for for Mana, as you said, you know result against Longford in Brewster Park, um, you know. I sort of had to check twice when I seen that Fermanagh are in the are in the I suppose the reckoning for for um for promotion. But you know you have to give it to them. Fermanagh under McManaman are doing the best that they can do. And to be fair to Ryan McManaman, I think he's doing a damn good, decent job there. And uh, you know I suppose again when it came down to it, uh, at the start of the year, if you were doing out a set of goals, you would be saying to yourself, promotion for Fermanagh to get into a promotional. Uh, scenario that's what you wanted against Offaly, they probably would have fancied their chances. So, you know, if 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 Fermanagh can get the job done, it's it's for the year. It's, it it really is a, as an achievement, and you have to, I suppose, think Fermanagh beat Calvin as well, didn't it? And um, yeah. you know, and you know that was also champions. You know, you have to give it to Fermanagh. Fermanagh are, are definitely punching, probably at their weight, if not a wee bit above their weight, and. Uh, you know, for they've only what something like is it fifteen or twenty clubs in the county. You know, you have to give it give it to them for 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 being in that scenario. And obviously, awfully or there's a hurling aspect there to theirs. Um, but McNamee, you, you got to give that man um McNamee. You know, to keep coming back and back. But as as I would always say, there's no beating experience, and sometimes. Players in the thirties or late thirties can be easily discarded when they can offer so much more. And Mike to me is certainly doing that, and uh, it's a credit to Mohan as well and his mom, Molly's, but that he's able to get the best out of now. Mike to me, so 
I think it, it, it will be awfully. I, I think they have had a really good campaign. Um, but, you know, would it be surprising for Mana getting the result? Absolutely not. There's, you know, McManam's doing a good job there and they've some really good players. And um, the relegation playoffs, it's still hard to actually be thinking that two last year provincial champions <laughs> could be on the verge of going to Division 4. Um, Longford play Tip, Cavan play Wicklow. I suppose the big thing for Cavan and Tip if they don't put these Wicklow or Longford out of sight earlier on, they could be on the cusp here of Division 4 football because keeping Longford and Wicklow in the game for longer than they could be could be very dangerous here. Yeah, and uh, it's, listen, it's totally their own fault if they're, if they're not putting them away early and they keep them in the game that deserve to go down. And uh, obviously, the league tables never really tell a lie. And I suppose uh, what I forgot to mention was the, the Derry. The other game it was Derry and and Derry you would think give, given how they've played um sh- this thus far this year shoot that's back to back promotion should win the game that's back to back promotion again Gallagher will have done a good job there um and they're playing Limerick isn't it and yeah. you know that's no easy game and I suppose Calvin the last day out that they were feeling the fire from their backside there and uh, you know it was a it was a it was a point win by Derry, wasn't it? One point or a draw. It was a draw or one point win for Derry there. So, you know, Calvin obviously are, are playing a wee bit better. They've felt the fire at the backside. And, but they find themselves in a position where they should never be. Um, you would have thought after last year's escapades that they would have a wee bit more about them and um, a wee bit more professionally go and get the job done and get, get themselves back in the second division. But there, there are, there are certainly in, uh, that danger is only being being called a a, um, a one game wonder nearly, um, or one season wonder. So that's that's nearly as insulting as saying that 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 it was a bit of a fluke last year. So, um, temporary again, again they have good players, but uh, you know, it's it's it it's totally of their own making. Should win the game, but. Whether, you know, as you said, they're going to have to start well and have the game professionally put out of sight by early early doors, you know. So, uh, time will tell, but certainly you would think you would have to fancy Calvin and Tip. Yeah, then just Division 4, Waterford play Antrim, um, Loud play Carlo, and Sligo play Wexford into Division 4 Shield. Um, but, like, you'd expect Antrim to get over Waterford handy enough. I know going to Waterford will be a challenge, but... They still should have enough. Loud and Carlo will be an interesting one. Jerry Brennan on the sideline for Carlo, Mickey Hart on it for Loud, I suppose. <laughs> that brings a, a 